Welcome to the Houston area or the Houston African Violet and Gisnerian Society's July presentation. We're real happy this month to have Mel Grice, the president of the Gisnerian Society, uh, with us. He's going to be talking today about Fremulinas, right, Mel? That's right. All right. Okay, I'm ready. All right, take, uh, take it over. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. So good to see you. I miss you all. If I don't know you, you're just family I don't know yet. Um, when Sam asked me to do this, I said I want to try to show some photos of things I have. And so I'm going to attempt to do that. Uh, and then I'll show you some plants. You can see behind me, I've, I had to kind of stop bringing plants off the shelf because I ran out of room. I'm in my library computer room and there's not a whole lot of room there. So, well, uh, you probably all remember Charita, the name given to uh, these wonderful plants. And in 2011, uh, the botanists decided that uh, based on DNA testing that they were able to do that they hadn't previously been able to do, that uh, the uh, genus Charita needed to be divided up, and they divided it up into Damrongia, one of my favorite names, Anchilia, Libesia, Microcharita, and Primulina. And so if you want to read all about this, which is far more than I have time to talk about, uh, the first quarter issue of Gesneriads uh, talks about species, the first quarter 2012, most of the magazine is devoted to that, and the second quarter, 2012, is devoted to hybrids. So those are great resources. So when I'm growing a new plant, I always try to uh, learn as much about it as I can. This is a Dale Martin's photo of uh, Primulina vera, and Dale likes to take a really good close-up of a plant's uh, knotty parts, as she calls them. And a primulina typically has a, the stigma, I don't know if you can see the mouse cursor or not, right there. Usually it's split or cleft. This is called a bifid stigma. All right, and that's really characteristic of a primulina. So that's about as technical as I'm gonna get there. I hope this would be a lot more seamless. Can you see the china, hopefully? Yes. This most primulina are found in uh, southern China and northern Vietnam. And this is a typical uh, photo of the karst. This is the limestone karst uh, rocks that primulina grow on. So you have to, I always have a lot better luck if I know where a plant grows and how it grows. All right, this is primulina bulata, basically growing on cracks in rocks. And just like the African violet cousins from Africa, uh, they just grow in where there's just a little bit of soil in the crack of a rock, so they really don't need much soil. They're very shallow rooted. All right, this is Primulina medica. Can you see? If you, if you can't see it, let me know. But this is Primulina medica basically growing in the rocks. This is how you'd find them. So again, not much soil there. Primulina diffusa has stolons, so the main grouping of the plants are growing right up into the top of the photo, and uh, then they're sending stolons that just kind of creep across the rocks, and um, if they can take root, great. This is a photo that Irina Nicholson took, and this is the 100 Demons Cave, and a lot of primulina are found growing on the rocks near the mouths of caves. So you can see down at the bottom of the uh, people. And so all these plants growing on these rocks up here and just getting a little light from the opening of the cave, these are primulina tobaccum growing. There, can you see that? This is one I took at Nancy Cast House. Uh, she grew this. And this was, for a long time, the only primulina under that genus name. And it, if you rub the leaves, the leaves are very soft. It, it, it smells like tobacco. So that's where it got the name. So the blooms are nothing like what you are used to seeing with the, the typical leathery leafed primulina. But 
this was an older name. So there's a complex process to name plants that Linnaeus and, uh, started. And so you have to go to an older name if you decide to rename something. So, so they found out that this was very closely related to what we were growing as Charita. Very, very beautiful plant, but very sticky. And it must be kind of close to catnip because if I rub this and go see my cats or something, they just go crazy. So it must be somewhat similar. There, can you see that? This is Primulina longa calyx. Longa calyx. Again, this is how they would grow, uh, bug eaten a little bit, but beautiful bloom. <clears throat> Here's one of the Chinese botanists uh, pointing out where they would grow. So just kind of hanging on there in the side of the rocks. This is Primulina pinnatifida. And you can see it just is growing along. There's not much soil there and there's just water running down. So that's how we would get some water occasionally. Uh, back in 2010, uh, we had the World Gesneria Conference in uh, Sarasota, Florida at the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. And Stephen Maciejewski uh, was there, and I was there too. It was a great experience. But anyway, Stephen uh, developed a relationship with Professor Wing Thang, and this is Hong Chin here. And he visited China, and so as a result of all this, uh, they formed the Gesneriet Conservation Center of China. And just great things have come from this. So Stephen is like our best roving ambassador. So thank you, Stephen. So this is the sign for the Gesneriet Conservation Center of China. So the Gesneriet Society and um, the Guangxi Institute and the Guilin Botanical Garden formed the Gesneriet Conservation Center of China. Now, Stephen has gone back and forth and he leads tours there when we can go there. And now there are five uh, Gesneria conservation centers around the area in different cities. So a lot of the hybrids uh, come from there. This is a display house in the Gesneria Conservation Center of China. You can see the karst rocks and you can see how they've got the uh, Primulina growing on the rocks, trying to mimic how they would grow in nature. And then they drew some in pots. This is Primulina wensii growing on uh, rocks. And this is very similar to how they would grow in nature. Just getting established there. And I wanted to show how they are growing in uh, large clay pots. And you can see here, these are large rocks, the large limestone rocks that they place in the bottom of the pots. And so, aha, this, I saw that so several years ago. And so I started doing that too. So I will talk about that in a little bit. So remember that, but there's not much room for soil here. Once you fill up the pot with large rocks like that, little bit of naming. Uh, this is a beautiful little plant. Look at the size of the blooms compared to the size of the plant. Anytime you see a name of a primulina ending in E-N-S-I-S, that means it's indicating the origin or place it came from. So this, is, this primulina came from an area or a town named Shu Chen. So a lot of the names, because they are places in China, look kind of complicated. But uh, if you take off the ending, you can see where they came from usually. So based upon that, I want to tell you a little bit about how I grow. And I um, have read so much that the president and the officers of the Gesneria Society are not supposed to recommend things. So I am taking off my presidential hat and I am uh, telling you how I do things. And so I'm going to probably name some products. So uh, those are things. So that uh, I'm going to do. So I, I can't do it otherwise. All right. You notice that uh, they grow on limestone. So I have started, can you see this? I have started to put ah, small little limestone chunks. I, I found that uh, if you Google limestone rocks, you, uh, there's something to do with a pool or the filters in a pool. 
So I don't have a pool, so I don't know what exactly that is. But so I got a bag of what's supposed to be limestone rocks. And I have been putting those in the bottom of my pots and my uh, primulina seemed to really like it. So I have put a lot of, a lot of those in there. Um, I like really flat pots. And you see, I don't know how well you can see, but uh, these are five inch pan pots. All right, and they have a bump up in the bottom. You can see that, so that so they're not just flat on the surface of the, uh, wherever they're growing on. So that gets a little bit of extra air there. So I like that. Uh, one thing that I'd like to do to start out a plant uh, I like these. This is a Kroger yogurt cup. All right. I have one of these every day for lunch. And I don't like all the writing around it, but there's Kroger brand and there's, I believe, Chobani. There's some of these that have these shrink wrapped. Uh, all the information is shrink wrapped on there. So you can just pretty easily remove all that and then you've got a nice little pot well yes easy for me to say um, of course when I want to do it I can't but anyway you can take that off and then you are left with these little pots like this and again they have the bump and then I take my drill electric drill and I drill holes in the bottom and then I let's see here and then I've got a nice pot for a starter plant. Okay, this is uh, Primulina Omen, which is a hybrid by Peter Shallot, one of the nice hybrids. And um, so those are started. I have found that um, when I grow, I, I was growing on mats. I put egg crate and then I put, this is capillary matting. This is Vatex capillary matting. I like that. And so I was trying to grow the primulina on right onto the mats because I, I have way too many shelves and way too many plants. And so I was trying to make it easier on myself. And I found that uh, the primulina were staying too wet. They were just not happy. So now what I'm doing, everything is sitting on the wet mats, but I have these clear saucers in various sizes with the little raised up ridges. And so the primulina are setting on, each of them have their own saucer, and I water those in about, oh, uh, 10, 15 minutes or whenever I can get back to them, I dump off the extra water that they haven't soaked up. So that goes under the mat. So they, they seem to be a lot happier that way. So, so I found that. Um, okay, excuse me, I have to find, <laughs> I'm running out of room here and I have to find everything. Okay, um, one thing I learned also, a nice pot, my good friend Paul Kroll in upstate New York showed me these. These are from Dollar Tree stores, the dollar store. And it's only a Dollar Tree. The other dollar stores don't have these. But they come, the large size comes two for a dollar and the smaller ones come together like this three for a dollar. So they make really nice flat uh, pots. You can drill, again, you have to drill holes in the bottom. And if you want to take them, uh, take your uh, plant to show, just save one without holes and you can fit right in there and that would make a very nice pot and you didn't even know it's a soup bowl. So, uh, but I haven't found them at any other dollar store. So I hope they still keep having those. So, uh, okay, pots, let's see, what else? Uh, I don't write, I don't have labels. I don't use labels because I have three cats <laughs> and cats love labels. So even if you just would set up 
plant aside in my house for just a minute. It seems like the cats come out of nowhere and they pull the labels out and toss them up in the air and uh, they're just great cat toys. So I write on the pots with uh, silver metallic Sharpies and it's uh, easily washed off with Mr. Clean Magic Erasers. That's one of the best products they ever made. <laughs> Mr. Clean Magic Racer takes it right off and so you can reuse the pot and and everything and it is cat proof so that yeah. all right let's look at some plants here um where do I want to go excuse my back a minute get these okay can you see this all right. In the African violet world, this we would refer to this as variegation, but this in, in a primulina, this is called patterning. So it's a regular pattern on each leaf. So this is uh, primulina dryas, and it's the silver in single quotes clone. So it's a selected clone. You propagate it vegetatively. All right, it's kind of hard to see here, but if you grow African violets, hopefully you've learned by now that you want to look for threes, leaves of three. A primulina, this is uh, the typical two by two or a cross pattern. All right, this will not make as nice a show plant because especially the rosette ones if you want it to look more like a a nice rosette you look for threes and i don't know what it is about but but when you propagate as many plants as i do you look for uh plants that have come up as threes in a triangle instead of two by two instead of the fours they make great show plants Let's see. This is what I mean by the two by two. This is Primulina uh, brassicoides, and then it's the marble leaf clone. You can see two by two. I have never had one of these make the, th the three yet, but I'm still looking. Hopefully someday I will get one. But anyway, this is coming along quite nicely. And it has the nice pattern in the middle of the leaf. All right. Here is Primulina patina, the typical Primulina blossom. Can you see that? I don't know where to put it. <laughs> okay. All right, and this is a Peter Shallot hybrid, a great hybrid. This particular clone, this came up, this is the pattern of three. It's making a nice rosette. You can see the threes, the triangles. All right, this one, however, patina usually has the nice red hairs that give it a kind of reddish cast on here. But this particular one has so far never had the red hairs. So again, you know, things sport and things happen. So I did save this one and I'm growing it on because it has the nice uh, three leaf pattern. All right. Um, something last night I was really excited this is this has never bloomed for me. <laughs> and last night I looked at it and oh my gosh, it's got a bloom. It's opening up. This is again in the three pattern. Usually it comes up to lead, the plants come up as a uh, four, but it's got a nice three pattern. And I don't know if you can see the bloom. It's kind of about an inch inch long and it's kind of what I would call beige or light cream and then the corolla or the throat is kind of maroon. 
So that's the first time that's ever bloomed for me. I was kind of wondering. But what it's done, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but the bloom stock comes way over here, comes under the leaf, and then comes back up again. So it's had these uh, different segments, like right here. That never opened up, but finally it's got like another one now that this finally opened up for me. So it's kind of exciting the first time you see something that uh, has bloomed for the first time. So... What is it, Mel? You didn't say Oh, that I word. forgot to tell you. Uh, M-O-I. I, I, I love the name because it's short. You don't have to write a long name. M-O-I. I suppose it's named after, usually when that ends in I, it's named after somebody. So probably it's uh, named after somebody or someplace named or Mo, M-O. So it's a very nice short name to write. You know, some of the names take you forever to write the names on, the, on your pot or wherever. So... Uh, Again, this was when it was growing too wet, the uh, leaves would kind of brown on the edge and wasn't very happy, but now I've taken it off the matting and put it in the little trays and it's much happier. So that's, uh, that's the first time that's done anything for me. Okay. Uh, excuse my back here. Just reach these. Probably most of you have seen Primulina Loki. This is a great Peter hybrid, Peter Shallot hybrid. This is the curly form of Primulina Loki. Now again, it's growing in the four leaf pattern, two by two but it's really a pretty plant. And I've really struggled with this one, but finally now I think I'm uh, getting it down where it likes, where it's happy, where it's got the right amount of light and the right moisture. So you can see there how I run in the pot. So thank you, Linda Hall, for if she's listening, I don't know if she's on or not, but anyway, this came from Linda Hall. So it's just a really interesting form of Loki. So plants do sport and do make nice things. Let me see here. Put that up there. All right. Um, this is Primulina cordata, another species. And it's had all these bloom stalks on for over a year. Sometimes some of the primulina just take forever to open up. I have never had this open up yet. I took this to a show last September, a year ago, and it's got all these wonderful blooms. I've seen photos of this in bloom. Uh, it has great big blooms, and it's going to be tremendous if it ever opens up. So I've just about decided that I was growing this under lights, and my lights are on basically for 12 hours a day. So I think a lot of the species... Um, Maybe don't like that amount of daylight or amount of light. So I'm going to move this to a window and just try to grow it with natural light and see if these will open up. So you just have to find where a plant is happy. But it has these nice, interesting kind of cupped leaves. And oftentimes the blooms come up underneath the uh, leaves and you kind of have to bring them out. So hopefully someday this will open up and this will be tremendous. So, uh, but this is very sticky. It's very soft, but it's very sticky. It gets on your hands. And uh, like most primulina, if you just look at this crosswise and you're, you're very easy to break off a leaf. It's very hard to get this to a show. So if somebody does, reward them. But it's very beautiful. I like it. This is similar. This is uh, Primulina glandulosa variety young shuensis, or yang shuensis, excuse me. And it has these little tiny, I don't know if you can see those, little tiny white flowers. And the leaves are kind of, a, there's a lighter silvery pattern in the middle of the leaves. Uh, I've seen some clones that have a little bit more of the silver pattern in the center, but it's very, it's similar to cordata, but 
not quite the same. But very interesting. But this one I get to bloom all the time under lights. It doesn't seem to mind. So at least it likes my 12 hour days. All right. Then there are some of the uh, primulinas. This is lobulata. You can, little tiny white flowers. Similar in texture, very, very light leaves and textured to, to uh, primulina tobaccum. So there's a lot of these like this that have very small flowers. So that's just coming along. Okay, here's a starter plant of H-U-A-N-G-I-I. -I. So it's probably named after somebody named Wang, I guess. This is a starter plant and it's blooming very, very early. You can see I grow in solo cups to start with that are wicked and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this will have a lot of flowers. Okay. Something similar, this is uh, Primulina species nova. A lot of times they will say that when a plant has just been uh, found and they're not sure what it is, so this will probably have a name change. But again, nice little, nice little flowers, little white flowers. And it just blooms like crazy. And this just kind of spreads and it's just like a, think of it like an African violet trailer. It just kind of makes its own clump and it'll just really fill a pot very easily. Here's a wonderful little plant, Primulina petrocosmioides. It looks like a petrocosmia, but it's a Primulina. And it just blooms and blooms and blooms. And I know Dale Martins has just made a hybrid with this and with Medica, which is a great big plant. So it'd be really interesting to see what, what that turns out. But it's really nice. You can see purple flowers there. Uh-huh, but just, and just blooms and blooms. All right. Now, let me talk a little bit about how I uh, propagate. And I, pro I love to propagate plants and I propagate way too much. Usually I take them to plant sales at convention, but of course that didn't happen this year. But um, let's see, where am I gonna put this? What I like to do is, let's see. Yeah. I pot up solo cups and then I have these uh, tray toppers. You can see they have holes cut the size of a solo cup. I got these from Christopher Violets. So if you wanna know more about them, write me privately. But on the permanent trays, they fit on top of there. And originally they were sold like this. And you can see they come right to the edge. That This is like four, by eight solo cups. And I grow, I cover everything with domes, the plastic domes. And so because of the solo cups at the top are wider, uh, you can't fit the domes on there. <laughs> so I, I asked them and I said, can you make me some that have uh, one less row? So this is, this is four by seven and see at each end, there's a wider space and then the domes fit on top of these. So what I do is once I've propagated my plant and put it in the solo cup, I am a big proponent of a prod of couple products called Clonex. I don't know if you've seen this or not. This is like a purple gel and uh, these are from the hydroponic stores. I imagine you have all these. You have people that grow all the funny, funny stuff. <laughs> and they, they have uh, propagated, they have uh, 
formulated this. So this is how they make their cuttings and how they do it, but we can use it too. And it really works really well. So this is like the purple gel, which I may dip the end of the leaf in there or the cut end. Um, and then in the trays, this, this is a, uh, again, made by Clonex and they call it the same thing. So if you, uh, it's available at Amazon or places like that too, but you see the same product says Clonex and you see one's like a hundred milliliters and this is 946 millimeters, but they're about the same price, but this is a yellow liquid and I mix this in, uh, like a gallon of water, about a, oh, small teaspoon. And then this is what is the water is what the trays are filled with. So the um, trays are nice. And so if you can see here, the cello cup doesn't go all the way down. So I just fill the water level up to about, uh, oh, half an inch or an inch less than the bottom of the solo cup. So anyway, they're always drawing up the water that's treated with the Clonex solution. So they just take off like crazy when you do that. And those I don't have to water each plant. Uh, this is Primulina opiophagoides. It's kind of spiny. And I could never propagate these I, I would put down le individual leaves of, of this and Wensii, and I could never get them to uh, root or take root. But once I, I thought, well, I'll just try it like I'm doing the other ones. And it was the exact opposite of what I thought would happen. I thought they'd just rot like crazy. But once they are in constant contact with the Clonex solution, they just take off and root like crazy. So that's just an accident that I came across but otherwise they just don't root for me if I do it the other way. All right, let's see. I'm gonna try to go back to a picture here. There, can you see that? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, if you have a larger leaf, of course, you can dip the Clonex just a little bit in right there. But if you have a large enough leaf, you can cut it in half or, or maybe sometimes even if it's a long leaf into maybe three parts. And every place there's a vein, plantlets will appear. So if you want to make a lot of plants, you can do that. And what I do is I, I dip my finger into the Clonex and I just lightly rub it along here to kind of seal and protect the edge of the leaf so it doesn't rot. And that works really well. Of course, I wash my hands really quickly, but, uh, but that, that seems to protect it and keep it from, from rotting. There, can you see that? Yep. Yeah. All right. This is Kenneth Moore with Primulina Dreamtime, which is a John Bogan hybrid. And see, Primulina can get quite large. <laughs> this is not a candidate for a light stand. So they're all different sizes of Primulina. Okay. In, um, some of you have seen other talks I've done. And in my garage, like one half of my garage, I built a plant room in. And... Um, it's heated and air conditioned and there's way too many plants in there. But Primulina, I think are really kind of low light plants. And so this is a cart on wheels that I roll between the shelves. There's lights on three sides of this. And so there's no um, lights directly above this. They're just getting bounce light from um, the other shelves. So they seem to be quite happy there. So now occasionally there are one or two that seem to take more light. And so this one here is kind of reaching a little bit. So he's not happy there. So that's one probably I need to move someplace else. But most of them are growing quite nice uh, under these covered domes on the shelf, just getting bounce light from everything else. So they don't really take a whole lot of light. And some of them do bloom right here without the direct light overhead. 
So I make use of every <laughs> every square inch I have. Mel? Yes. It's Dale. Once in a while, um, on the bottom of the screen, somebody will ask you a question. How do you grow linear a calyx? That to me is like a trailer wannabe. It just, you could never have that a uh, single crown plant, I don't think. There, can you see that? That's one Bill Price grew. So it, it's just a trailer wannabe. So again, in a very shallow pot, great blooming plant. All right, here is a young linear calyx already starting to send up several shoots. And so I will just pot this up and just kind of let it spread and it will just take off like crazy. But it's a great little plant. Oh, I see the chat now. All right, let's see. Okay, uh, I don't usually put rocks in the solo cups because I, I don't usually do that. Um, I'm, I'm putting more and more rocks in than I used to. So uh, I, I used to add dolomite lime to the, to the soil mixture. And my, my soil is very, it's taken me 50 years to come up with my soil <laughs> mixture. And I use, it starts out with about half uh, Promix uh, HP, which is, stands for highly porous. And it has a lot of the uh, perlite in it. And then I add about the same amount of perlite as I do the, so it's about half and half. And then I put in, uh, because that Promix has the mycorrhizae, the beneficial bacteria that we used to always kind of uh, boil away. We used to sterilize soil and kill all that stuff. Well, now I don't do that anymore. And so I, I put in, uh, I'll make about 15 gallons of soil and I'll put in about a cup of, um, dried molasses. I know that sounds strange, but I've learned that from uh, several people, Paul Lee and, and uh, Nicholson's in uh, Texas. And uh, it's, it's sugar basically, and it feeds the beneficial bacteria. And I get great roots. If you you got to have great roots. So um, that seems to work well. And then I put about, oh, uh, half a cup of lava sand. I put that in. Uh, I think it gives us some extra minerals that um, maybe they don't get otherwise, but uh, you want to repot often. And I don't always do that. You know, I tell people to do that, do as I say, not as I do, but uh, because I'm home more now, I'm potting a lot more and my plants are just loving it and they really show that they like the attention. So, so that's a good thing. Um, what pruning do you do to your plants? Uh, well, of course, I, I take off any bad leaves. Uh, if you have, oh, that's a good point. Can you see this? This is a young plant of uh, Primulita charade, which had bloomed already. And it's got all these little immature leaves around here. I don't know if you want to see. If you can see those, those are never going to get big. You know, they're just taking uh, things away from the main plant. So you want to take those off. Anything, just like in a violet, anything that's smaller, just take those off because they're just taking energy, zapping the other plant. So then they'll take off. So now I've got like that, so that'll, that'll be good. So you never wanna have small leaves under big leaves. And, but these ones that you've taken off, they're young and if you wanna propagate them, they make really great plants really quickly, probably better even than an older leaf. So if you, depending upon how many plants you want, these make nice things to propagate with. Uh, let's see. A streptocarpella growing very slowly from a cutting outside. You're, you're growing it out? Oh, okay. Well, again, Clonex, I mean, I can't swear by this enough. This, this seals off the end of the uh, cutting and uh, it keeps it from rotting. So you can propagate woody plants with this, hibiscus, roses, anything, you know, this is the best thing ever, so. My, my soil mix for propagating is basically the same that I use for everything else. 
any, any new plant I get, I immediately take all the soil off of it and I pot it up into my soil because it has to grow in my soil. It has to be happy in my soil. So I've, I've got plants from other people and I just, <laughs> I feel like a snob, but I just hate other people's soil. I really like my soil and it works for me. But again, in Texas, it would be different for you or different parts of the country. You need to have different amounts of maybe, maybe, I can't put vermiculite in, but I would rot. But in Texas, you probably would need to put some vermiculite in uh, because it's so dry and hot there. So it just, you know, you have to find out what works for you. And just because I say to do this or do that, that doesn't mean you should do it. So like I said, it's taken me 50 years to get my soil mix. And I really like what I do now. Um, I noticed that solo cups have darker soil. Do you add? Yeah, it's my regular mix. So it's like about half and half. What causes brown tips on older leaves? I think uh, it might be a humidity issue. Uh, I, I have just about gone to doming everything because I either have heat or air conditioning on. I don't have, of course, for thrips or bugs, I don't open any windows. So I have, my house is 70 degrees year round, whether it's heat or air conditioning. So the heat dries things out and the air conditioning dries things out too. So I really have pretty much gone to doming everything. And of course that was also nice when I traveled a lot, but now I'm not doing that this year, but, uh, but it was made it really easy to go away and leave things longer. So if they're domed, they, they will last longer. Okay, Terry, hi Terry. Keeping sticky leaved primulene is clean. Cat hair, everything I have has cat hair on. It is in the air, it flies around. I mean, oh my gosh. And the sticky ones like tobacco and, and some of those like cordata, oh my gosh, you just always try and to. You can take um, like a lady's makeup brush, like a real soft bristle makeup brush that they apply their makeup with. You can brush that, but uh, it's just, one thing I found too is the doming kind of helps keep some of the cat hair down and the dust down uh, because there's not as much, uh, you know, it can't settle down on top of a thing. So that, that helps a lot, but oh, some of them are just uh, terrible to groom, <laughs> just awful. Um, yeah, primulated tobacco um, spread like a trailer. It, it sort of does. Not as much as linear calyx, but it does spread out. Um, Mel, you didn't discuss fertilizer and if you foliar feed and that sort oh, of thing. Oh, that's a good thing. Thank you, Dale. Uh, no, I don't foliar feed, uh, and I very lightly fertilize. Yeah, I, I don't think primulinas take a whole lot of fertilizer. I think if you repot often enough that they're, they're pretty happy. Sometimes I'll use a little bit of uh, Epsom salts in the water to green things up. I think that helps green things up a little bit, but I really don't fertilize them very much. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, so I want to ask about timing blooms for a show. There's no way you can time up Remulina for a show. Uh, it's not like African violets that you just you just have to grow a lot of plants and you hope that you have something blooming on the week of the show. But there, there's just no way. Like I showed you that one uh, that's been in bud for over a year. So, you know, there's no way that you can time them. Um, what's ornamental for a show? All right, um, that's good. Something with a lot of patterning is ornamental. Uh, this primulina moi, this is not ornamental. It's just a green plant. So that's not ornamental. I do have a photo of something. This is a Primulina uh, oh, wow. linearia folia, and this is grown by Brett Floelling in Canada. And he trained it like a bonsai, and so it's in like a, a Japanese looking container, and he's trained it down here. So this is considered ornamental. It's taken a long time for that to look that way. 
You could train it as a bonsai or a topiary. Uh, you've done something to it. This is Opiophagoides. Uh, again, here's the main plant, and then they've got these branches coming out. So this is mildly ornamental. It's not as ornamental as some things, but uh, this could be considered ornamental. So it's had something done to it. It's not just a plant that nothing's been done to it. Let's see. Um, okay, uh, yeah, you could grow primulinas outside. Alcy Maxwell in Louisiana, I know he grew some outside. Uh, I don't know that you'd want to, if it doesn't freeze, I don't know how they would do, but um, I don't put anything outside because I don't, anything I would put outside doesn't come back in. <laughs> so here in Ohio, of course, it would freeze, and I don't bring anything back in that, that's been outside. But you could try it and see. You probably could. All right, how do you pronounce Bayshuensis? B-A-I-S-H-O-U-E-N-S-I-S. All right, so that's coming from Bayshu, a place called Bayshu. So that is a great little plant. Um, I had a picture here. Let's see. It's one of my favorites. There. Okay, can you see that? This was grown by Dale, and it's just a tiny little plant, but the blooms are just as big as the plant. And this, even when it's in a solo cup, it just blooms its head off. So... I hope people hybridize with this. It's just a great little plant. What is it, Mel? Bayshuensis, Primulina bayshuensis. They were asking how to say it. And so it's just a great bloom, and it just wants to bloom its head off. And you can just see relative to the size of the leaves, it's just a huge bloom. And it's pretty, too. So, and it blooms all year round. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it's just always in bloom. So it's just a super plant. If you don't put rocks in the bottom of solo cups, do you put some perlite before the soil? No, I don't put perlite in the bottom. No, no. It, it, when, they're, when they're rooting like this, I just, just fill it up with soil. So, no, I don't do that. Uh, but you could, let's see. Yeah, Paul Sizzy, hi. I found that when you grow primulinas, you will have something in bloom all the time. And that's really true. But it, it, they're just great plants and they, they do bloom really nicely. Okay, pest prevention. Okay, that is a really big thing. You don't want to bring pests into your house. Like I said, I don't open my windows, the thrips and things can come in through screens. Anything I bring in new is isolated. I can't stress isolation enough. Um, and if, some people think that if you bring home 30 plants from, a, from a plant sales and you put them all on your dining room table away from your other plants, that's not isolation. No, that is not. If one plant has something, they're all going to have it before you know it. So anything that I bring home immediately gets bagged in its own individual plastic bags. Plastic bags are your friends. And anybody that's been to my house knows there's a plastic bag sitting around all the time. And sometimes I do forget to take things out of plastic bags. Sometimes they've been in there several months. But um, plastic bags are your friends. If you do put something in plastic bags, make sure you take the blooms off because the blooms will get mildew, rotty and ruin your leaves and everything. So don't put anything that's blooming or with buds in your plastic bags, but isolate, isolate. When I repot, I put marathon granules in the soil in the bottom. Uh, every time I repot something, so I, I do that as a preventative. Um, I do, I do spray the plants when I repot them. I have this mixture that I got from Pat Hancock. She's my mentor and friend and second mother, uh, Buckeye lady. And, uh, I, I mix, um, in a gallon of water, I mix basically about a quarter teaspoon of Avid and a quarter teaspoon of 
conserve and uh, about the same amount of neem oil. And I spray the plant with that. And so I, I do that as preventative too. But since I grow in the house and I grow where I and the cats live, I don't want to spray there. So I do try to just spray in the one place in the garage because um, I don't want to get any bad things from spray. But the main thing is you keep, you keep pests out. Uh, another thing I have done too, I, I use uh, beneficial insects. Uh, the, the product I like the best is it's an insect called Aureus insidious. If you, um, O-R-I-O-U-S and then I-N-S-I-D-I-O-U-S. And uh, I'll, I'll get some of those in there. They, they look like little black gnats, but they're not, they fly around and they eat thrips and they eat mealybugs. And they're, they're really nice. And you don't know that they're there. I mean, you never, once they're there, they do their job. They're not annoying like gnats or something that are flying around. You think, oh my gosh, he's got bugs flying around his house. But, um, you know, they really do a good job. And I, so occasionally I do um, in, insert those in case I brought something in that I don't, you know, don't want. So, but I don't, I don't do it all the time, but, um, but they, they, that's what I like the best. So let's see what else. Okay. Suckers on a plant. Um, it, they're, they're up to you. If you're, um, growing for show, there's no hard and fast rule. You can have a multi-crowned primulina. And some of them will look quite nice that way. Uh, or you can have a single crown. So if you want a single crown rosette plant, of course you remove the suckers. But if you, uh, if you don't care, there's nothing wrong with suckers. This one, if you can see here, this has a sucker coming right in here. So I, to me, I think it looks better if it's just a single crown, but that's just personal preference. So probably I will remove that sucker there and when it gets any time now, it could be removed and pot that up. And again, I would dip the end in clone X and it would take off like crazy. Thank you everybody who attended. Um, give them a big round of applause. Uh, thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, and we hope to see you again soon.